Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully uh, everyone can see me and can see my slides. Uh, welcome to uh, DDD. Uh, sadly, again, not in person. Um, was really looking forward to kind of getting together again at one of the community events, but uh, hopefully, hopefully next year uh, things improve for everyone. Uh, just going to call out the code of conduct. If you haven't sort of seen this in any other the other sessions, um, the usual stuff. Be nice to everyone. Uh, be respectful and. Uh, do you know share your questions and viewpoints in Discord, but just be sort of considerate of what you're posting there. Um, also, if you are so inclined uh, and have a bit of spare cash, uh, please do donate to uh, the National Museum of Computing, where all the proceeds for this event are going. Um, it's a really good uh, museum, and uh, I think it's a, a really good place to to kind of help that uh, move forward and and uh, continue going. So, if you do have have some spare cash, there's a link there to to go ahead and do that. Um, of course, thank you to the sponsors uh, for helping kind of get the get the event going. Um, always uh, valuable at these community events. So I really do appreciate all of the sponsors that come on board for these events. And uh, do feel free to tweet, uh, tweet your day, uh, you know, use the DDD 2021 uh, hashtag and let us know if you're enjoying it, if you're enjoying the sessions and, and kind of how you're getting on it. Helps keep these events kind of uh, promoted and, and make people aware of these things happening so that they can get involved as well. So I'm going to try and cram a, basically a 60 minute session into a 60 minute slot, but I want to try and leave some time for questions. So I'll sort of uh, fly through a few of the slides just so that we have enough time at the end for those questions if they come up. Um, I should introduce myself. My name's Steve. Uh, I'm an engineer at Elastic, uh, Microsoft MVP and Pluralsight author. Uh, you can find me online. I'm at Steve J Gordon on Twitter. So if you want to reach out to me after the event, uh, follow me there. That, that would be great. And uh, please do so. And in terms of what I'm going to cover today, this is this is going to be an introduction to Elasticsearch for people that maybe haven't ever used it before or are just sort of getting started with it. Um, and we'll not only introduce Elasticsearch uh, itself, but also how as .NET developers uh, you can start to use Elasticsearch and uh, uh, I work on the team that maintain uh, the language clients for, for Elastic, so uh, I'm, I'm working heavily now on the Elasticsearch.net uh, client that we're going to look at today. A uh, bit of marketing spiel, I won't go too deep into this, but if you haven't heard of Elastic, uh, we're the company behind Elasticsearch, and we today build many solutions that are built on top of a single stack. Uh, products like Enterprise Search, observability products and security products. Um, you can go to our website, you can find out all about those. I'm not going to uh, sort of spend time on marketing today. I'm, I want to get into the, the examples. So just to set the scene as to what the stack is that we're going to be talking about, um, the focus today is on Elasticsearch, which is kind of the heart of, of the stack. This is where we can store data uh, and where we can search and analyze that data uh, directly. Now, there are a few other parts to the stack that are worth just kind of calling out. Um, we have Kibana which is kind of our UI uh, for visualizations and managing um, the other products within the stack, including Elasticsearch. So uh, if you're kind of new to Elasticsearch, uh, it's always worth spinning up the Kibana UI somewhere, connecting it to your Elasticsearch cluster uh, to help you sort of manage things and, and prototype things as you're going. Uh, it's got a UI, as I sort of say there, for sort of doing all of that stuff. So it makes it quite simple um, and uh, a good place to get started with things. The lower level of the stack uh, includes a number of products that are really about getting data into Elasticsearch. So uh, we have Elastic Agent, uh, we have Beats, and we have Logstash. Um, Elastic Agent is it's kind of a unified agent, I guess, for ingesting data from numerous different sources. We have Beats, which are a set of lightweight shippers. Um, and again, these are about sort of placing these on your on your systems and at the edge of your uh, servers and things. Uh, to send data and ship that data to Elasticsearch. And we have Logstash, and this is about sort of ingesting usually log uh, files um, and transforming them uh, to maybe enrich them or configure them so that they kind of are stored appropriately in Elasticsearch. So these, these components can all work nicely together. In terms of how you run the stack, um, the simplest solution that I sort of recommend to people that are just getting started today is to go and spin up an environment in Elastic Cloud. This is a software as a service solution, a cloud environment. We can run uh, the cloud instances uh, on all of the major cloud providers. So wherever you've got your existing servers and data uh, running in the cloud, you can have your Elastic Cloud instance nearby. 
And it's just a really quick and easy way to get started without having to know too much about what you have to do to actually spin up the server and configure it correctly. Um, if you do find yourself you know, locked into on-prem type environments, that's entirely uh, supported as well. You can, of course, use Elasticsearch in a standalone form, spin it up on a server of your choice, uh, whether that be a VM or a physical machine, um, and you are therefore fully responsible for kind of getting that thing running and configuring it, um, but it gives you, I guess, the most control, and it's, you know, maybe how some of our legacy uh, customers will still be using Elasticsearch today. And then we have kind of have a middle ground. So perhaps you want the benefits of sort of not having to do all of that configuration and management yourself, but you're tied into your own uh, environment. Uh, you can have a look at Elastic Cloud Enterprise or Elastic Cloud on Kubernetes, both of which allow you to kind of kind of get that middle ground. So many ways to run this stuff. And as I'll show you in the demo shortly, you can spin up uh, servers and Docker as well to uh, to get started if that's a, an option that you need to pursue. So before I get to the demos, uh, it's worth laying down some basic terminology because these are words that I'll probably be using uh, throughout the rest of the session and I don't want people to kind of get left behind because I haven't explained what they mean. So let's start with cluster. This is kind of the biggest unit of uh, sort of work that we need to think about. And this is really just a collection of servers that happen to all be running Elasticsearch and working together, therefore, to hold your data and provide those search and indexing capabilities. So the cluster is the overarching concept um, of, of just those servers working together. Um, there's some basic configuration that we, we can provide for the cluster. And there's some cluster state that gets kind of managed uh, by the cluster and whichever of the nodes ends up being uh, elected to be the master node um, to coordinate those activities. But you don't have to worry about too much of that stuff for getting started. Um, you create uh, a cluster simply by spinning up an Elasticsearch server configured with a particular cluster name and it will just uh, start operating as that cluster, potentially joining it if it already exists. The nodes um, is really just another word for a server. Uh, you know, these are instances of Elasticsearch fundamentally. Uh, you would typically run Elasticsearch um, as the dedicated process on, on a server or a VM. Um, it can require a lot of resources, um, and so it's best to give it all of those resources on the machine so you're not got sort of competing applications uh, trying to steal those resources. And simply, really, you, you install Elasticsearch on one of your VMs, you spin it up and it, as I say, forms or joins the cluster based on the cluster name that you've configured. And each of these nodes is where we uh, essentially are going to be storing the data um, and they're going to provide you know, the, the indexing and search capabilities over that data that they happen to hold. There are different roles for, for nodes. We won't get into that today. It's not too important from a getting started perspective. Um, as you mature with your sort of use of Elasticsearch, you will typically start um, particularly as you get into production, maybe assigning specific roles to specific nodes so that you can balance how the load is spread across your system and you can design your system to be sort of fault tolerant and, and highly available. But, but out of the box, most of the nodes get most of the roles and so they'll be able to sort of perform any of the functions necessary within the cluster, including potentially being the master node uh, that gets elected. We then create uh, one or more indices uh, inside our cluster and these may or may not be spread across multiple nodes i'll explain uh, a little bit more about how they kind of get allocated in a moment but really the index is just a collection of somewhat similar documents uh, and we'll get onto the exact details of documents in a moment but this is a way of kind of separating data from other data um, elasticsearch is a schemaless data store um, and so what this means is you can store documents with different properties and fields on them uh, within the same index and that's perfectly fine and your data can sort of mature over time and you can add data, uh, add fields to your data as you go. That's perfectly reasonable, but it still makes sense to logically separate our data into those sort of somewhat similar buckets. So, for example, maybe I wanted to add uh, full text search to my uh, blog then I could uh, create an index that's going to hold all of the blog posts that are in that blog and obviously all of the titles and the descriptions and the actual content that we want to be able to search over. They're all somewhat related. Uh, you know, there are blog posts within the blog context and we just store them within an index. That's fine. Um, this sort of sin single index strategy is fine for scenarios where you do have a kind of a relatively uh, finite amount of data. Now, 
you know, I'll add a blog every now and again, but I'm not going to grow this thing significantly over time. Um, other scenarios you may have and that are particularly popular is for storing log file data, as I touched on earlier, ingested, you know, potentially through Logstash or Beats, or maybe it's data that you're writing in uh, from applications in some form of metric. That data continually grows over time, and therefore it makes sense that we might want to separate that data in such a way that we can provide a more manageable uh, sort of indexing strategy. What we don't want to do is continually pump that all into the same index because this single index will just keep growing and it's going to get harder and harder to manage it uh, over its lifetime. So a strategy there that most people will use is to use kind of time based uh, indices where we spread our data by some unit of time. Maybe we create an, a new index every week or every month, uh, depending on how quickly that data is coming in. Um, and those indexes then store the data for that particular time period. And you can still search over more than one index at a time. Uh, so you can still search a, a long period of time, even if you've separated your data into these weekly indices. Um, but it does mean that those indices are now much more easy to manage. Um, we can move them onto maybe different powered nodes over time so that we can slowly uh, move them onto cheaper and cheaper data storage, for example. Um, we can also over time archive those and potentially delete them from our cluster uh, as the data is no longer necessary. And those kind of things are achievable manually, but most commonly people will use uh, a feature called data streams that we have, which is kind of going to handle all of that for you. So I'll give you a kind of single logical uh, data stream that represents logs uh, for, uh, for some uh, purpose. And behind the scenes, it will create uh, indices as you specify uh, and roll over to the new indexes as, as time periods move on. Um, and it all, will also use another feature called lifecycle management uh, that allows us to put those uh, indices onto those kind of maybe more commodity hardware over time because you probably search your log data for the last week or maybe the last month uh, more regularly than you search data from two or three years ago. And so you might want to move that data off onto cheaper storage so you're not incurring so much cost, um, but it will, be cheap, it will be a little slower to search when you need to. So these kind of strategies are things that, again, you can work out over time um, as you kind of prototype your applications and move them to production. Uh, the next uh, important term is a shard. Uh, we don't need to go too deep into sort of sharding strategies today, um, but really the shard is how you subdivide your data within an index. Now, reasons you might want to do this is, is mainly about spreading load, and as we'll see in a moment, considering uh, resiliency as well. So if we just had a single shard for our index, then one node is handling all of the workload, the indexing work and the search word uh, work for that uh, index. If we, however, decide that maybe it's better to have multiple primary nodes, we can specify this up front when we create our index. And now it means that we can split the data uh, through a hashing of the ID, um, Elasticsearch will send the data to an appropriate shard. So now we've spread the load a little bit across our three nodes in our system. Uh, so this can be particularly useful if you've either got high indexing or high searching loads, um, because you can start to spread that load across your, your different servers and make most use of them all. Now, this is good from that sort of load balancing perspective, but uh, it doesn't help us. For example, if node one here uh, was to go offline um, and crash, uh, we can't access the data from the, the first primary shard, um, and that's going to be a problem. Now, we might be able to search the remaining data from the existing nodes that are working, although we'll get incomplete results, um, but we certainly can't index new data that should be going to shard one, um, and we certainly can't search it. So that's that would be a problem. That would be a bad design, obviously, in production. And that's why you can also specify one or more replicas uh, for your index. And what this will do is create a replica of each primary shard. In this case, a single replica, which is sufficient to give us at least a first level of resiliency. Now, the nice thing about this is that these replicas can also be part of searching. Uh, so the, the search loads can also utilize these read only replicas. But it also most importantly means that if we do lose node one in this scenario, uh, the replica of the, the first primary is balanced onto a node different to the primary by Elasticsearch by default. So as long as there's enough nodes for this uh, to, to be managed, Elasticsearch will never put the replica next to the primary. And this means that we now have a replica on node two that can take over as the primary if it needs to. If no one doesn't recover quick enough, then that replica can, can take over. Um, 
and Elasticsearch just manages all of this for us. So this is why we have shards involved. You do need to have some uh, plans for how you plan to shard your data up front that you typically will sort of learn as you prototype your data because it, it very much depends on the volume of data, your configuration of your cluster, your indexing and searching requirements as to what strategy makes sense. Um, but it is a good and important consideration to have. The final unit of terminology that I want to highlight is documents. I sort of mentioned the term earlier on. A document is really just your data. Uh, and in Elasticsearch, a document is stored as a JSON uh, blob, basically. You send the JSON in that you want to index, and that will be stored into the appropriate uh, shard. And you can, as I say, evolve this data over time. You can add fields. You can, you can pretty much do what you want uh, as you understand the data that you have in your system. Um, there are a few important points around documents. So one of the most important things, I guess, to kind of highlight from a beginner perspective is we don't provide a schema for Elasticsearch up front, um, but what we can do is provide something called a mapping. And this hints to Elasticsearch how it should consider data that it receives in different fields. So by default, Elasticsearch can handle data that it's never seen before. So if you send it a new, a new field in your JSON document, it will do the right thing as best it can. And that was that's through some basic rules. So if it looks like a number in the JSON document, it will be stored uh, as one of the number fields in Elasticsearch. If it looks like a string, it will be stored as a string uh, and treated as such. If it can be passed to a date, then it will be treated as a date. Those kind of simple, simple rules, really. Um, and this means that by default, string data in particular is, is indexed in a couple of different ways. Um, it's indexed into what's known as sort of a multi-field concept which means that uh, we store the data once in its kind of keyword form, which is basically for exact matching. Um, but we also do uh, uh, and some analysis on that string uh, to break it apart into the individual tokens. I Really, the, the tokens are usually going to be the words. Um, and then there's some an additional kind of cleanup that happens. So things called stop words, so things like and, the, it, uh, which don't add much value to search, are removed. Um, and all of the tokens are lower cased as well. So this then gets stored into Elasticsearch in, is uh, the inverted index. And this is the capability that really gives kind of Elasticsearch the ability to uh, very quickly uh, do full text sort of search uh, over your data um, through that uh, inverted index. So again, it's not stuff you, you have to sort of totally get to grips with uh, from day one, um, but it's important to understand that Elasticsearch is, is kind of doing these these default rules on your uh, data as it sees it, and that you can, uh, as you understand your data, choose to map your data more specifically to appropriate field types. And there's there's tens of different field types for things like you know geodata, IPs, um, all of the different sort of number formats you might want to deal with, and you can be much more explicit about how those fields are mapped um, as you understand your data. So the way we interact with Elasticsearch is through its HTTP interface. We have, I think, something like 400 endpoints now on, on Elasticsearch that provide access to all of the capabilities. And that's, you know, all of the basic stuff like indexing documents and searching them back out, as well as, you know, understanding the state of the cluster, uh, configuring and using some of the ML capabilities within Elasticsearch. Um, all of those are accessed through the HTTP interface. Which brings me on to the language clients. Uh, we have language clients for kind of all of the big uh, top languages you're probably using today, uh, .NET, Java, JavaScript, etc. So there's a language client where if you tend to be wanting to use this stuff. And what the language clients provide is, you know, a library that you can pull into your applications that do a lot of the heavy lifting for dealing with, you know, forming requests and responses to the server, um, and then actually sending them and, and dispatching them there. So the clients are a good way to get started with Elasticsearch without having to you know, build all of this stuff from scratch. So I work on the clients team and I maintain the Elasticsearch.NET clients. Uh, I say clients because technically we have two packages uh, that you might see in NuGet Package Manager, for example. We have Elasticsearch.NET, which is our low level client. Um, and typically this isn't the one that you want to start with. Um, so if you're a beginner and you're new to Elasticsearch, you probably don't need to pull this in yourself. Um, what this offers is kind of the foundational layer of sort of dealing with uh, communicating with Elasticsearch. So it's dependency free and it's fairly unopinionated and its main responsibilities really are handling the transport, 
uh, to and from the cluster, understanding the nodes that are in the cluster and doing some sort of basic round robin load balancing and flagging any nodes that happen to be sort of dead, um, and the low level kind of request response concepts that we have. On top of that, we have Nest, and Nest is our high level client. Um, what this provides, and this is why you want to use it, you know, pr pretty much in most applications, the 99%, I would say, um, is that it provides strongly typed requests and responses. So rather than dealing with the raw JSON that you have to kind of get in and out of the server yourself, uh, we provide models, classes that represent those requests and responses, and we can handle the serialization and deserialization of those uh, when they're going to and from the server. We also provide a query DSL, so the sort of pretty much aligned with the, the DSL that's in Elasticsearch itself, but sort of .netized, I guess, uh, that allows you to work with the, the querying capabilities, which are indeed quite complex uh, as you get more involved. And so Nest provides all of this out of the box, and we can see Nest in action shortly um, by jumping to some demos. So uh, do feel free to drop any questions into the Discord. I will try and check it in a second. Um, because time's quite tight, I'll probably uh, get to those towards the end, um, but uh, let's have a look at the sample that we're going to going to work with. And uh, oh, actually, I just see there is one quick question that's worth answering here. So from David, so how does the removal of stop words, uh, for example, and work if you're using other languages? Do you need to specify the language being used, and can it support uh, multiple languages? The answer is yes, it can. Um, there are different analyzers. Uh, that you can register into your analysis pipeline for for your index, um, and there's there's uh, there's there's analyzers for all of you know the, the big the, I guess the common languages. Uh, there's hundreds of them I think in 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 there behind the scenes, and so they know how to kind of understand the different sort of tokens they may encounter. You know, for example, understanding uh, you know Chinese text, for example, is going to be a little bit more complex uh, than maybe the the you know the, the English text. So the the analyzers for those specific languages know how to to, you know, to deal with those individual um, rules, I guess, within the languages themselves, and what consider you know you would consider a stop word, for example. Um, the default pipeline works with sort of uh, you know, English. But you can you can you can change that on an, a per index level if you need to for different data that you're working with, um, and you can use built-in sort of analysis pipelines, or you can construct these yourself and build them up from individual tokenizers and filters uh, that you may want to apply, so that you can build up really complex uh, requirements that you may have as well. So that was a great question. So thanks, David, for for raising that one. Uh, so. Here we are, we're in the demo, um, and we're not going to go too pre advanced in a beginner session uh, and the time that we've got. But what I do want to do is kind of show how we can get some data into Elasticsearch and get it back out again. So the data that we're going to be dealing with is this stock data. Uh, this is just a CSV file I grabbed off the internet. It's five years worth of stock data for the Fortune 500 companies at the time. Uh, I think it's 2013 to 2018. Um, and each row includes for a particular day, the stock data for a particular um, stock symbol, in this case, uh, AAL. Uh, so we can see we've got the date, we have the close and open volumes for the stock on that day, the volume that was traded and, and the stock symbol. It's not very complex and we're gonna, we're gonna ingest this manually into Elasticsearch with a .NET client that we're gonna build out. Now, in terms of where I'm running Elasticsearch today, uh, because I always assume that this demo might actually one day happen in person, uh, I'm not relying on sort of network connectivity and, and internet uh, conferences uh, to be good. So I'm actually going to run Elasticsearch locally, and I already have Elasticsearch running. And the way I've chosen to do that is through Docker, uh, which is a really you know nice backup plan. If you don't want to use the cloud or you can't use the cloud, uh, this is the next best thing really um, for local development. Um, so I've got a very simple Docker Compose. We won't go into Docker in detail here, but you know I'm using the latest Elasticsearch image. Uh, there's some basic environmental configuration, including the cluster name that this node will join when it starts, um, and that's pretty much it. Um, I happen to also be running Kibana so that we could use a UI. We're not going to today, um, but it's very easy to spin both of those up with a Docker Compose file. And if I jump to my browser, I'll just bring this one over and refresh this. Hopefully, yes. The server is still live, so I can still talk to Elasticsearch. This is the, the root endpoint, so it just gives us some basic information about the, the cluster and the server that I happen to be talking to. So I have Elasticsearch. I have a .NET application. I want to begin using it. So I'm going to do a little bit of, it's mostly going to be copy paste for time, 
um, but I will do a little bit of live code for the for the Jeopardy that introduces um, along the way. The first thing is we need to add the uh, the Nest NuGet package, and I'm just going to paste in the package reference for that. You could do this through NuGet Package Manager. You can use the UI. You can use what you want. Um, and I've pulled in uh, the latest Nest version that we have at the moment. So once that restores, I'll be able to add a using uh, declaration up here uh, for Nest, hopefully. Indeed, I can. So now I can begin uh, with my application. We're going to be doing all of the work in a single index. Uh, I'm going to call that index stock demo v1. So I've got a constant string for that. And the first to do we have here is to create the client. So I'm going to create the client. In this case, it's just a console application. Um, but you may be using Elasticsearch, you know, in .NET Core uh, worker services or ASP.NET Core. Um, the general rule with the client is you want the client to be treated as a singleton within your lifetime of your application, because behind the scenes, we're going to be managing connections to the server, managing state about the, the nodes that we have. So if nodes goes down, we'll, we'll stop trying to send them requests for a period of time. Um, and so if you create a new Elastic client every time you need it, uh, you're going to lose the advantages that that kind of behavior has. And, and there's a you know a fair amount of configuration that uh, goes behind the client each time that you're going to just be throwing away uh, unnecessarily. So the the plan is to you know have a single instance. I'm going to just create a single static instance of the Elastic client. I'll call that client and I'm going to create a new Elasticsearch client. So Visual Studio 2022 is pretty cool. It's it, it's learning, I think, as I go uh, about this demo. So uh, it seems to be better and better at auto completing things. So we need a new client. The default new client here with no sort of settings passed in um, is going to attempt to connect to localhost uh, port 9200, which happens to be the default port for Elasticsearch. And so I don't actually need to do any clever configuration here to be able to set this thing up. You can, of course, pass in uh, settings of configuration to the client to control its behavior and control the nodes that you might want to communicate with. But for, for now, we don't need to do too much. So the first job I'm going to do is see if there's an existing index in the server. And if there isn't, then we'll create and seed uh, that index. So um, let's do uh, a new request. So I'm going to do uh, uh, a request here through the client. So I'm going to do client. And in this case, I want to access kind of a sub subsection of the client specific to the the index uh, sort of APIs that we have. So uh, indices and I can do exists uh, async. Choice of async and uh, uh, synchronous code. You know, pretty much today you always want to be using async um, because, you know, it, it means we're not tying up threads. But if your code can't use async, uh, you, you're still covered. We, of course, need the uh, wait keyword here, and uh, this now needs to be an async uh, task main method. So the last thing we need to do is pass in uh, the name of the index, and I've got my static uh, index name, uh, my constant index name there that we'll just pass in. So this will, uh, when it executes, we'll, we'll send a request to the server. The server will look up to check if it, whether it has an index or not, and if not, create it. Uh, we'll create it. So what we'll do is say if the exist response um, is not uh, or exists is not true, uh, that means we don't have an index with that name already. We'll do the work to create it, and we'll do uh, a create request next. So we can do await uh, client dot indices uh, indices dot create async. Uh, and we could start by just saying we want an index named, you know, uh, stock demo, uh, stock demo v1. Uh, but we can also do some other stuff. So I mentioned mappings earlier. We're going to get too deep into mappings, but it, it is reasonable that what you might want to do is for our stock data, we might want to control how we map the fields. And the example we have here is we do have a field that's relevant to the stock symbol, uh, so MSFT for Microsoft, for example. We will not be doing full text search over the symbol. Um, we expect people to you know, pass in the exact symbol that they want to filter on and we'll be able to search on that. So rather than letting Elasticsearch do its default, which would be create a keyword and a text field uh, for that as it comes in, we're just going to create a keyword, which is for exact matching requirements only. And we can save ourselves a little bit of space in our index by not uh, in, you know, registering all of that text into an inverted index that's never never going to be looked up. So the way I'll do that uh, is I can just create a, a lambda here. Um, 
I, I've called it C, I don't know why. Um, that doesn't really matter. And we can we can actually then use what's known as the fluent syntax that we have in, a, in the client that allows us to essentially chain you know, lambdas all the way down if we want to, uh, to fluently configure things. So in my case, we'll call the map um, setting here. And why have I got insert on? There we go. Uh, and what we'll do is say, uh, let's map, uh, auto map our type. And the type I'm going to map here is uh, this stop data type. So let's just briefly look at this. This is really just a POCO class. Um, the main bits on it are the properties that align to those that are in the CSV file that we're working with. The only other thing I've done is I've added a, a name property which isn't in the CSV file and a very basic dictionary lookup for a few of the symbols, not all of them. Um, and so that means that when we construct this, we can just pass in a line from the CSV file and we'll, we'll split out all of the relevant parts. So a pretty simple sort of POCO class there. And uh, we can do something called auto mapping, which allows Nest to infer a little bit about our type um, just purely based on uh, based on you know the properties of the type because we can use reflection things to go do we have a field named id maybe the, you want to treat that as the id field for example um, but what this means is after we've done we've done auto mapping we can also configure the properties on here and we'll um, jump in and set specifically the rules uh, which uh, dictate what we do with that symbol uh, column. So in, in this case, what we want to do is we, we want to specifically and explicitly say that we want that to be a keyword field. So I'll create a new keyword uh, field uh, mapping here, and the name of which is uh, just going to be uh, the name of the property on my type that contains it. And because this is, we have these set up as generic methods and we know what type you're working with, we can provide a way of actually mapping into your type here and say, okay, well, what you want to do is access the symbol field to make that our um, to be to make that our um, keyword field specifically here. I'm probably missing an extra brace there. So that's uh, set up a basic mapping, and we could do other things in here. For example, oops, excuse me. Um, uh, let's go down here. What we do is maybe we want to do uh, settings as well. So. Uh, we could configure a number of things about uh, an index before it's created. Uh, for example, I could set number of shards. Uh, I'll set one in this case because uh, I have a single node. So we could also set the number of replicas. Again, not much value in a, a single node cluster like this one, um, but we could do these kind of settings. So once you know what type of index you want to create, that's, there's a lot of configuration that you can pass it in there. Now, uh, thank you for you. I'm pretty much done with typing. Uh, what I will do is do my last bit of typing before I start copy pasting and say, uh, let's just create response. Is it valid? So did we get a kind of 200 from the server? Um, and uh, in this case, not valid. Um, and if create response dot uh, uh, acknowledged. So if it's not valid or not acknowledged by the server, then we'll just throw uh, a new exception. Oh, no. Uh, so we get these, you know, we get sort of status codes back from the server, obviously, um, and we provide this kind of abstraction over those. So just check, you know, was was the response valid in a in status code sense, and did the server tell us that it acknowledged our request to create the the index, and that's being presumably handled by the server. So we we at this stage should have an index created. I'm going to post in my next block of text, and this is text responsible for uh, indexing some data. So. There's lots of ways you can do this. Uh, you can send in an individual document through our index endpoint, um, and that's that's great for sort of ad hoc data as, as you get it. Um, but the efficiency of that's not great for high volumes of data, and we have hundreds of thousands of stock data items we're going to send in here. The reason that wouldn't be very efficient to do, uh, you know, per request is we're going to send that many HTTP requests to the server. So. What we recommend in that scenario is you use something called the bulk API on the server, which allows us to provide in a uh, new line delimited JSON where we have a, a set of uh, um, operations that we want to perform on the on the index. Um, and, and one of those operations you could perform is index a document. <coughs> Excuse me. So you could work with that API directly through the client. Um, and if you do so, there's a few considerations you'd have. So. For example, what happens if some of those operations were not successful? Uh, what happens if the server you know, gets a bit overloaded and starts returning a 429 telling us to back off for a bit? 
um, you know, what do we want to do in those scenarios and, and, and how do we batch and, and ship our data up? To make that easier, what we provide in the client is something that we refer to as a helper. Um, and in this case, we're going to use the bulk all helper, which is basically take this innumerable of data that I have and index it for me. So the bulk all helper, this isn't directly related to a specific endpoint as such, but it will use the bulk API, API behind the scenes. But this accepts uh, an innumerable, in this case of stock data items. We're getting that innumerable from this little helper method. All this is doing is streaming through the file, reading a line at a time and yielding it back so that we have an innumerable of data. Um, the, you know, this could be data coming out of a queue, it could be, you know, wherever it's coming from uh, that you might be happy to receive it. Um, so that's our, our data, uh, or our innumerable data. Then we pass in the, again, through the fluent syntax, we pass in some configuration for this bulk operation. So in this case, we say, well, the index we're going to use is our, you know, our constant index name. We might want to set back off retry. So if the server does start returning 49s, uh, how many times should we try and back off by default um, and then retry? What's the back off time? So how long do we wait before reissuing requests in that scenario? We can also control parallelism. So uh, yeah, if we've if we're able to, we can batch this data up in such a way that we can send parallel HTTP requests containing the data. Um, and so, you know, we can balance this based on, you know, processes in our machine, maybe. Um, and maybe also, you know, it depends on how many shards we're running as to how efficient this might be. But we can uh, start taking advantage of those scenarios. Another thing we need to determine is per request, how much data do we want to send? And in this case, we'll send a thousand documents per HTTP request. So we'll just keep batching those innumerables up into blocks of a thousand and then send the request. Um, balancing the size is an interesting, uh, you know, challenge. It depends on the data you're sending, really. Uh, somewhere between 100 and 1,000 tends to be a good trade-off um, because if you send millions of documents per request, obviously that's a very big JSON blob that you're sending up uh, that both sides of the client and server need to handle. Um, and that can actually become less efficient than just sending more HTTP requests. So uh, size, you know, you can experiment with the figure because it depends on how big your, your JSON uh, documents are really. Now, what this returns is an, uh, an observable. Uh, you may or may not have seen the observer pattern in .NET, um, but ultimately what this means is this is an operation that's running in the background um, and we can write code that observes what's happening within that operation uh, to decide what we do with it. So at this stage, the operation is batching documents and, and uh, shipping them up. Um, and so what we might want to do in this scenario is wait until all the data's um, completed. And in this case, we'll just use a helper observer that we have called wait. Uh, this takes a time span for how long we want to allow the operation in total to, you know, to run, so essentially a timeout. And then in this delegate, we get back each response as the um, observable returns them. Um, and in this case, we can just you know, operate on that data if we want to. In this case, we'll just log to the console, but we could do something more exciting uh, with, the, with the actual response object. So this should be all we need to get started. Uh, and so let me spin this up. I'll start it without debugging. Um, and once this begins running, I'll just bring this window over here and I'll probably need to Hopefully the font size doesn't matter for this window, I don't think too much, because it's just indexing data, it's running through in the background. Uh, it's doing what we need it to do. So I'm going to close that, leave that running, um, and the data will be indexed. So I think we've we've achieved our to do of creating an index uh, some data. Let's get on to some search scenarios. Uh, I won't go you know into massively detailed ones in the time we have, but it's worth just kind of understanding how you get data back out um, before we kind of wrap up today. So this first scenario that I'm going to paste some code in for is uh, where we, we want to actually specifically filter data down by the term uh, on the symbol, in this case, maybe for the Microsoft uh, symbol. So this is uh, fine, but we index that data specifically as a keyword only field, um, and we're doing exact matching uh, matching here. So that's uh, going to be pretty easy. Um, so I'll paste in the request and then we can just sort of step through what this is doing. So again, I'm using that sort of fluent Lambda syntax here. We can uh, also use what we call the object initializer syntax, which is really just a case of creating the, the uh, request, uh, the search request as an object. So new search request and setting properties on there. 
Um, so you can use that if you prefer that syntax. You can kind of mix and match these to some degree as well. Um, so it just depends like how deep you're getting. And of course, you can kind of cache parts of search requests and reuse them elsewhere by you know, saving the relevant portions of either the fluent uh, con uh, syntax or the objects that you may want to use. So we're going to call the search endpoint um, and we're again going to search our index. The query here uses the kind of fluent query DSL uh, for querying and this tries to model as closely as we can really in .NET the, the syntax that you'll see if you're building up the, the JSON uh, query through uh, you know some other tool if you're actually just talking to Elasticsearch directly. Um, and so in this case, what we're doing is a very simple filter uh, that says give us the data from the index uh, where the term for the symbol field, so field is symbol here, um, has the value MSFT. So again, we get this kind of completion uh, and field name inference, so we don't have to hard code the, the actual field name that Elasticsearch will be using. Um, we can just take, use nests inference here to say, well, just, you know, form the JSON for whatever the symbol field is going to be named. And, you know, the default behavior for that inference is that we just send uh, camel case uh, field names through uh, when we when we send this data. So we're searching for the, the, the Microsoft um, uh, symbol. We can set a size. So how many documents do we want back from the server? Um, and we can we can sort those just as you might with something like SQL Server. And we can say in this case, given us them descending by date. Again, if we have an invalid response, we'll have an exception. And otherwise, what we'll do is act on the response. So on that response, we have a documents property, which is a shortcut into the hits data that you get from Elasticsearch. And these are the deserialized uh, stock data objects uh, from the JSON that the server has sent. So these are just you know, instances of the stock data type, so we can access the properties and work with them in this strongly typed fashion. And all of that deserialization is handled by the client for you, so you can just kind of work with strong, strongly typed data here. So hopefully, if I uh, configure this to, or set this running, uh, we will see a couple of important points. First, we didn't rerun all of that seeding uh, because the exist response uh, identified we had the index already and it's done. Secondly, we have 20 rows of data that represent the most recent data uh, by day uh, for Microsoft's stock at the time. So these are the high and low values that we printed out. It's nothing too exciting, but we've got some data back through a simple kind of filter. Um, and that's a term based filter that we applied. So that's, uh, you know, the keyword kind of searching. You're probably here because Elasticsearch is capable of full text search and you might want to do that. So let's also do a search, but this time we're just going to ask for the data where the uh, the name of the company uh, includes Inc, in this case incorporated. So does it include this token uh, in the data? So let's paste in the search for that and then we can kind of, again, talk through a little bit of what that's that's looking like. Um, so uh, very similar to the last one, we're still talking to the search API, we're still using the same index. This time we're going to do a match query, which is basically saying for a particular field, can you try and find this text? Can you find a match for this text? Now a default behavior for these, this name field is, uh, we didn't provide a mapping for it. So it's, while it's because it's a string, it's both a keyword field and a text field, so it can have full text search, which means that the data has been analyzed, the tokens have been added to the inverted index. And uh, when we do a match, our query term, in this case, just a string that we want to search for, is also going to be analyzed. Now, this only includes a single token, um, but it, it will be analyzed and then it will be looked up in the inverted index to find which documents contain that term, and then it can be uh, those can be returned. So again, we'll take the top 20 uh, in descending by date and print out uh, some details about them. We'll run this um, and we'll we'll see what we get back from the server. So this time we get, uh, it looks like we get three rows per day. Um, and the reason we get three rows per day is we have three companies in our name data uh, that happen to include Inc. Uh, we have Amtech Inc. Dot, we have uh, American Airlines Group Inc. capitalized I there, which is important, and Macy's Inc. with a lowercase i. 
So I, I added these mappings in myself, uh, or you know, these lookups for, for these names from the symbols myself with my sample data. So I intentionally made them use different casing and things just so that we could prove a point here, really. The, the point is that we search for INC, all lower cased. We match things that have different casing because remember that default analysis pipeline is going to tokenize the data and then lower case those tokens. So it doesn't, case is not important for this search. Um, and things like, you know, uh, punctuation, et cetera, have been sort of ditched as part of that tokenization process. So we've matched three companies um, per day, and that means we kind of, we have um, three different sets of company data per day showing up in our results. So full text search, very basic full text search in action there. The next thing we might want to do is something a little bit more exciting where uh, we want to do some analysis of our data. So we want to do, you know, some what's called aggregation. Uh, so this is really just, you know, powerful versions of essentially a group by that you might see in, in SQL Server. We want to organize our data by some fashion potentially, and then we want to do maybe some other operation on there. So I'm going to paste in an aggregation uh, based search here that we can just walk through. Uh, I'm conscious time is ticking away and I do want to leave a bit of time for questions. So I'll uh, try and get through this as quick as I can. Search endpoint again. Uh, we're searching the same index. This time we set our size to zero. So why might we do this? Well, if we're only interested in the the actual sort of aggregation data, so the analysis of the data, not the data itself, um, we don't necessarily need the document results coming back. And we can save obviously a lot of data over the wire by avoiding sending those if we're not accessing them. So in this case, we're just going to look at the aggregation data. So the query in this case is just the same as we used in the first example, where we're basically saying, give us everything for the Microsoft symbol. So again, we're doing a term based filter there. And then the aggregations is the exciting part, I guess, of this example. So we're going to do two levels of aggregation. The first thing we're going to do is essentially a group by, but by date. So in this case, we're going to use what's called a date histogram aggregation. We access that uh, off of this aggregations fluent syntax. So we can just uh, chain together a number of aggregations we may want. So we add a date histogram aggregation. The name for the aggregation that we're going to use is our own name just for being able to pull it back out of the response data later on. So in this case, we'll call this by month. And then again, fluently, we can configure our uh, date histogram aggregation settings. So in this case, the interval we'll use is by month. So we want the data grouped into monthly buckets. Uh, the field we're searching on is the date field. Again, we can just use uh, you know, our strong type to define which field we want to use. Order, so the order of the buckets. So in this case, we're going to get the most recent uh, data first. And what we're going to do, not only are we are going to group the data by month, but we'll do something more useful and do some sort of basic analysis. So in this case, we're going to do a sub aggregation that says we want to sum the data. So a new aggregation here underneath the bucket of date histogram. We're going to sum that data together. We're going to name this trade volume. So this is our, our name for the aggregation again. And we're just going to sum on the field volume. So basically what we're saying is group the data together by month. Then for all of the, the documents that occur within that month, sum up the volume uh, field on them. So we can see what the total number of trades were for, for, for all Microsoft stock within that month. The data that we get back from here um, is uh, going to include the aggregations are on the search response. And from there, we can access those and we provide a kind of nice way to access specific aggregations. So in this case, I'm going to ask for the date histogram aggregations. The date histograms that I'm interested in are by month. We only have one date histogram here, but we might have others on our data. So here we're saying give us the date histogram that's called by month and access the buckets and we will have a bucket which is just the logical grouping of that data uh, per, per month. Once we have the buckets we'll loop over them and within each bucket we'll access the sum aggregation so that's sub aggregation and because this is a very simple sort of number based aggregation we just have a value property on there that gives us that total total sum and we'll print that data out. So that's pretty much all we need so let's run this code and uh, see what we get. I'll just make sure that there we go. So if I scroll up here, um, you can see that from uh, so 1st of uh, February um, uh, 2018 is the, the start date of our first bucket. And these were the total number of trades for February for Microsoft stock in that in that month. 
the next month back is January uh, 2018, then December 2017, so in descending order. So these are just those start dates and these are you know, the trade volumes in each of those months. So a very simple aggregation, but you know you can imagine you might want to do this for a number of uh, exceptions that have occurred within an application per hour, and you might want to chart that data uh, in a dashboard in Kibana, for example. So these are the, the reasons you might do those kind of basic aggregations, and you can get very advanced with aggregations and combining how you sort of break down your data as is necessary. So the best place to go for all of that is to just go to the documentation for Elasticsearch and start to read through the documentation specific to aggregations and understand the different types and where you might use them. But we have different aggregation types for a lot of the common things you're going to want to do um, out of the box, you know, different date ranges and all that kind of stuff. Um, let's very quickly paste in the last piece of code and then I'll get to questions. So this is <clears throat> a, a caveat that this code is, is maybe not what we would uh, recommend exactly going forward, but I just wanted to show it for completeness. So a scenario might be that we have a, an index containing data and we want to actually get that batch that data out so that we can do something else with it. So maybe we want to uh, store it in another data store. Maybe we want to um, yeah, re-index that data, but we want to do that kind of on client side manipulation. So we might want to pull every document back out the server. Now, as I say, the, today we recommend a slightly different way of doing this, but I don't have a helper to show for that yet. We're going to be adding it. Uh, so today what we'd recommend you do is open what's called a point in time on the server, which is a very short lived context that basically takes a sort of snapshot of the state of uh, indices at a point in time and freezes them so that you can search over them consistently. And then you would use the uh, search facility that we have, the search API, using something called search after. So basically, if you want to get data uh, you know, blocks of data starting, you know, with different pages, basically page through the data, then you can say, give me the first 100 results and it will give you a key as to uh, the the sorting uh, that it's, it's applied. And then you can push that back in on your next request as your search after information to say, OK, give me the next 100 after that. Um, and that's typically how we'd recommend doing efficient uh, uh, all accessing all data today. I'm not showing it in code because we don't have a helper and it would require quite a lot of manual code to show it to you today. Um, that's definitely something that's on my radar to, to add so that we can make that support um, in the box. But what you could do also, and it would work perfectly well in this scenario, is, is use Scroller, which is essentially the same thing. There's a particular Scroll API that we can use for doing this. And again, we're using a helper here rather than manually doing all of the stuff to scroll and handling errors. So this scroll all helper again is an observable. And in this case, we say saying that we want to scroll data. The lifetime of the scroll context is going to be 10 seconds that refreshes on each request. Um, and we want to, in this case, slice the data such that we're going to do it by process account in this case. Um, but this would allow us to run parallel um, queries against the server. And as long as those uh, the data has been sharded in the in the appropriate way, you'll be able to actually issue parallel requests that get pushed off to the appropriate nodes and, and start bringing this data back uh, in parallel. Uh, and in this case, the search I'm performing is just a simple match all on my index in blocks of 100. And again, the max degree of parallelism here just allows me to control how this is sort of parallelized in .NET. And I'll match that to my number of slices. And again, we have a helper that allows us to wait on this, in this case, for up to five minutes. And then when I get the responses back, I'm just going to push out the symbols that are in the document. It's not particularly exciting, um, but basically allows me to prove that we're streaming data back from, from the server. And if you have this scenario, you know, it's, it's a little less likely that you have this, but there we go, the data streaming back. So we, we've kind of gone end to end in this little hello world of, uh, of the .NET client. I'll stop that there because we don't need all the data. This demo um, is available online. I'll, I'll put up the link to that uh, at the end of the, of the session. Um, but this is just scratching the surface of what Elasticsearch can do and what the client can do. But the concept here pretty much should apply to most of the endpoints you'll deal with. You can send them requests either using the strongly typed object syntax or through these kind of fluent methods where you, uh, you know, dot your way down into the different uh, properties and things you can configure on those requests. Um, and uh, we will send the request for you and give you back the strongly typed response. Um, and you can build, you know, pretty powerful ingestion uh, pipelines and search based applications over your data using the .NET client. So let me wrap up and I'll just switch back to slides for the, uh, the couple of last slides and then see if there's any questions. So it's one thing that's 
quite worth me mentioning and is, is very well timed is, is what's going on with the client today. So uh, the client, I joined the team about a year ago and I've kind of been maintaining the 7x version of the client um, for that time and adding new APIs and things. One of the, the big challenges is that the client is in pretty much entirely manually created from the top level meta client. So this means for every new endpoint that the Elasticsearch team add, I have to model the request and the response types. I have to deal with any of the weird serialization that we might need to handle there. And that takes time to get into the into the .NET client and the product. So that's not great. From, from my perspective, because my time spent sort of doing um, this kind of fairly boring legwork, and from a consumer point of view, things can't ship quite as quickly as we want in all cases. So for the next version of Elasticsearch, we have some opportunities to do things a bit differently. And one of the one part of that really that we're doing is uh, we're working on code generating most of the .NET high level client. Now, this is beneficial for many reasons. Um, but basically what it means is we have a specification that the language clients team have been working on together, which is a big representation of all the endpoints Elasticsearch exposes um, and the requests and responses and the different properties, whether they're required, what they're called, all of that kind of information uh, for all of the endpoints. And this means that we have this common schema now that we're going to use to co-generate all of the those types, all those request response models, um, all of the client endpoints, etc. Now, this means that Hopefully what we'll be able to do is be able to provide very consistent and more rapid uh, inclusion of those new APIs and endpoints as they appear, because it's just a case of running the code generation. Um, because this means we're going to introduce, unfortunately, breaking changes, because as soon as we move from these lovingly handcrafted types to these uh, auto generated ones, there are going to be some different naming things that occur and we've had to do some namespacing uh, to support you know, the risk of uh, type names conflicting and that kind of thing. Um, and so I've also taken the opportunity to try and simplify the API a bit and listen to feedback I've heard about the fluent syntax being a little complex and things like that. Um, my hope is we can make those uh, sort of method signatures a little bit easier to grasp um, and make the APIs better. And because I'm spending less time on code, manual code creation for these endpoints, I'll also be able to introduce more helpers and more value added features and work on performance. We're also moving to system text JSON. And the reason we're doing that is it's the built in serializer from Microsoft. It means we get good performance out of the box. We take no sort of additional dependencies because it's usually you know a dependency of yours already from having .NET involved. And um, we will be able to kind of move away from basically an internalized version of a, a low level serializer that we have today that's got a little bit hard to maintain and, and, and deal with. Uh, we've also decided to extract the transport elements. So these are the things that you, we essentially consider the low level client today around HTTP transport. We've moved them into our own package. This means that A, uh, consumers can bring in that yourselves if you have low level requirements. So some consumers might have high, very high throughput services and you might want to manage the allocations very carefully there. So what you could do is depend on the transport package and manually worry about how you serialize the types yourselves so that you can control all of that very explicitly. Um, it also means we could use this transport for other future clients and, and we hope to have clients for some of the other services that we have as well. Um, and it means I can start focusing on, you know, other .NET goodness, like all of the high performance APIs with span and things like that. So there will be some big changes. I'm working really hard on this because there's a you know tight deadline to get it all done before obviously the client uh, Elasticsearch ships. Um, and I hope to have a version of that in alpha sometime soon. Uh, once I'm happy that the code is being generated for the core APIs, at least in a, in a very sort of useful way. So some resources uh, we have the Elasticsearch net repo under the Elastic organization on GitHub. This is where you can find the, the code for the client. You can raise you know, bug issues and feature requests and things there. Uh, the uh, docs for the client are on our Elastic.co website um, at uh, our guide there. Go and grab those, have a look. Um, I appreciate the docs could be better. Um, you know, One of the things I've seen as coming on the team is that I want to improve is the the form of the documentation, make it a little bit more beginner approachable. So we'll be working on those as well and trying to improve them over time. Uh, the next NuGet package, if you happen to be going to NuGet.org, is there. And the examples I've shown you today or a close version of them are on my own uh, GitHub repo, repo. So Steve J. Gordon, 
um, under Elasticsearch dash examples if you want to pull those down and, and play with the code. Um, finally, if you have sort of general questions, uh, both about Elasticsearch or the clients, you can go to our, our discuss uh, site to, to raise them. So these are more kind of how do I do X or what's the recommendation for Y, those kind of things. So thank you very much. I pretty much filled my time, but uh, I'm Steve J. Gordon on Twitter. So if you have any questions that we don't get to today, feel free to ping me on Twitter as well. Um, I'm going to drop over and just see if, if I've got time, I have one minute. Uh, so let's have a look at the questions. Uh, uh, Cake Monster, uh, if text is tokenized by word, can you do an exact match on multiple tokens one after the other? For example, can you find only documents where the text is exactly this is a match or where the words must be one after the other in that order? Yes, we have lots of different search types. So you can do phrase based matching where, the, the, where those tokens must be in a particular order and, and may, must form a phrase uh, and not just appear, uh, you know, just somewhere in the document. Um, or you can do that token based matching where you're, you know, looking for certain words and just find me all of the documents that contain, you know, this word or this word or this word and that word. You can do these different kind of uh, combinations with, with, we have sort of different sort of um, Boolean concepts so you can join queries together in pretty much any structure you want to so you can say this and that or you know whatever uh, um, to build those up so yeah it's it's very feature rich Just check out the documentation which from an elastic search side gives you all of that and then you can obviously go ahead and um, kind of um, dig into how you do that with nest uh, using this sort of nest syntax uh, so my time's up i will Keep talking here as, as long as I'm allowed to um, and I'm not booted off the live session. Uh, I see that someone is typing, so I'll give it time for questions to come in. Um, while, while that person is typing, um, yeah, I, I hope this has been useful. As I say, this is kind of a beginner level session uh, for what the client looks like today. I will probably update this next year as well when we have a maybe a new client to talk about with you know some, some differences. Um, and of course, I'll try and do some more of these for um other um sessions that you may ha may have so okay so uh the cake monster which is a, f a really great uh handle there uh glad i answered your question and, and that 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 was what you were looking for it doesn't look like there's anything else coming uh well, maybe maybe rashmi is still typing so I'll, I'll give rashmi time to get this question in um before we end but uh Otherwise, as I say, you can reach out to me online as well. Um, and, uh, you know, do also feel free to give me some, you know, honest feedback. You know, if you start using the client and, you know, I appreciate there are some rough edges uh, for beginners in terms of getting to grips with it. Give me those opinions. I may already be working on improving those, but, uh, you know, please give me that feedback. Um, you know, it's my objective to try and make this client, you know, not only good and easy to work with for seasoned developers of you know having used the client but also for for newcomers to uh you know elastic search as well we should try and make that journey as painless as possible for you as we can um so you know we, we will certainly try and you know improve the documentation so say is another objective of mine um and you know maybe if video content's your thing we can put together some some videos you know based on short scenarios you know how to do uh, particular things with Elasticsearch from a .NET perspective. And uh, if you also tend to code, you know, in other languages, uh, your Go or your Java or your Python, um, we have uh, a fantastic, I, I'm fortunate to work as part of a very great uh, small team at Elastic that work on the language clients. So there's about eight or nine of us now. Uh, and we, we look after all the different language clients. Uh, we're all very passionate about obviously our own, our own languages and trying to make the clients idiomatic for those languages. So um, if you prefer other languages and you've watched this session, uh, you can also reach out to any of my colleagues who will happily help you as well. Uh, OK, so Reshmi, OK, it wasn't a question, but you've used the Elastic dashboard and you found it to be a nice introduction to the use of .NET. So I'm really pleased for you. So I, I think uh, that's it. I'm sure some of you have left for other sessions. Um, so I think we're done here and we can probably end the live session. I will hang out in Discord for a little bit longer um, and try and answer questions uh, that may pop up in your minds later. Otherwise, um, I'll, I'll see everyone at another event, hopefully.